This is how you can use Discord's OAuth 2 to access user data and to make changes to a user. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing that we're actually going to go ahead and do is we need to go ahead and create an application. So you're going to go over to the Discord developer portal and you're going to go ahead and click on applications and we can just go ahead and make a new one. I'm going to do OAuth 2 and we can do testing just so that we know what one we're using. And I'm going to go ahead and agree to the terms. All right, so now that we have our application, we don't really even have to do anything with it, but we can just go ahead and make it look a little bit better. So I'm just going to go ahead and give it a logo. We'll just do some random asset that I have on my computer. So now that we have our application for this, we're going to go over to OAuth 2. So we need to go ahead and create a redirect link uh, or a redirect URI for the authentication to work when you authorize this application with your account. So we're just going to go ahead and do HTTP and we can do local host and then we can do just any random one. I'm just going to do 1500. We can do slash API slash auth slash discord slash redirect. So we're basically going to go ahead and create a local host and we're going to go ahead and redirect to this very specific path. All right, so after doing that, we're going to go ahead and save and we can go over to our URL generator. Now this is where we're going to give it all of its scopes and the scope is basically what the application can actually access from the user. So the main one that we want is identify because it's going to give you user information. Um, but I'm just going to select them all so we can do all the ones that we're actually going to want to use. So we can do basically this. Yeah, that, these are the main ones that you might actually want to use as a developer getting user information. So then we're going to go ahead and select the local host that we just set up. And now we have our link here. So if we go over to it and we go ahead and click enter here, it's going to give us our application and it's going to give us all of the permissions. So then when we go ahead and click authorize here, it's going to go ahead and redirect to our URI. But the main thing to keep in mind, even though it couldn't find any sites, is that it gives you the local host and then it gives you a code. So we're going to go ahead and make a handler basically that is going to take this code and return user info. So we can start this off by going ahead and creating a new folder and we can just go ahead and call this a auth to video testing or something random like that we can actually go ahead and open it up here so we're just going to go ahead and go into our terminal and we're just going to go ahead and do code space dot so this is going to open up our visual studio code platform now while we're in here we're going to go ahead and create an src folder and within this we can go ahead and create our index.js so then outside of that we're also going to go ahead and create a dot env and that's pretty much all we have to do so now we're going to go ahead and open up a terminal here and we can go ahead and install some dependencies so we're just going to go ahead and do mpmi axios and we can also go ahead and get mpmi.env and finally we can go ahead and do mpmi express so these are some dependencies that we're actually going to go ahead and use in this code to retrieve all the data that we need now the other thing you might need to do is you might need to do npm init to initialize your package so you can do npm init and then you're just going to go ahead and go through all of this information but for me i just went ahead and copied a package.json in here with all of the information i need in it all right so after setting up our package here or our handler, we can go over to our .env and we're going to go ahead and get a bunch of variables. So we can do client ID and we can set that equals to nothing. We can do client secret and we're going to set that equal to nothing again. And we can do our port, which is going to be 1500. And we're also going to get our token and we can set that equal to nothing as well. So we're going to go back over to the developer portal here and we're going to go to our application. So we're going to go back over to the general section under OAuth 2 and we're going to go ahead and copy our client ID. Back in this code, we can paste the client ID. And then we're going to go ahead and reset our client secret so we can get a new client secret key. I'm going to go ahead and put in my 2FA code. So now that I have my client secret here, we can go ahead and copy this. And I am going to reset this at the end of the video, just so you know. Then we can go back over here and we're going to go ahead and paste that secret in there. And the last thing that we have to go ahead and get is our token. So we can go over to bots and we're going to go ahead and click on reset token. So I'm going to go ahead and put in my 2FA code again. And I'm going to reset this at the end of the video as well, just so you know. So we can go ahead and click copy and we can go ahead and paste our token in there. So next, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to go ahead and close our env and we can just start by requiring our env config so that we can actually access the variables within this file so we can do require and we're going to get env and then we can do dot config and then after doing that we can go ahead and define our packages so we can do const express equals require and we're going to go ahead and get express we can do const axios equals require and we're going to go ahead and get our axios package and then we can do const url equals require and we're going to go ahead and get url so now we're going to go ahead and get our port so we can do const port equals process dot env dot ports and then we can do or and we're just going to get the same number uh, next we can do const app equals express so we're going to go ahead and create a new express basically so next we can go ahead and actually write in our handle 
handler that's going to read when we open up that authorization link and click authorize so we can get all of our information. Now, one other thing here is I did get this handler concept from Anson, the developer on YouTube. I've gone ahead and linked that video in the description below if you'd like to watch that and learn a little bit more about this handler. So next we can go ahead and do app.git and we're gonna go ahead and get our redirect. So this is going to be the exact same redirect that we used in our local host. So it's gonna be API auth discord slash redirect. We can get our request and we can get our response and we can go ahead and open this up with an arrow function. We're gonna go ahead and start off by actually getting our code. Basically how this works here is once you have your authorization link and the user authorizes it and redirects, what you're gonna be given is the authorization code grant. That's basically the exact same code I showed up here. Now keep in mind, I believe these do expire. You're gonna go ahead and basically exchange the access token for a token. And the token is right here, and that's gonna be what you need to use to get user data or to make changes to a user's account. Now, these also expire, and as you can see here, this is when it expires after this many seconds. To get a new token after they've already authorized the application, you have to use the refresh token to actually get a new token. So when this expires, then you use the refresh token to exchange it for a new token. So it's a little bit confusing here, um, but that's just how it works. Now, one other thing to keep in mind is you cannot access any users who have authorized your application after they do so. So if your handler is not up, your handler is not hosted, and you don't save any of this data to a database, you will not be able to do anything with that user later on unless they re-authenticate the application on their account. So now that we have all this information, we can actually go back into our code and we can actually go in and start by getting that authentication code. So we can do const code equals, and we're gonna get our rec.query. And after doing that, we can say if code, because if we don't have a code, we're not gonna do anything. And we can do const form data equals new URL that URL search parameters and we can actually go ahead and open this up here we're gonna get our client ID which is going to be our process .env .client ID, and we can get our client secret and that is going to be our process .env .client secret. so then after doing that we can go ahead and get our grant type now this is going to be our authorization code so we're gonna get our authorization and we're gonna get our code now this is going to be the same method you would use to get a new token using your refresh token um, but for now, it's just going to be the authorization code. So then after doing that, we can get our code, which is going to be our code.toString. Next, we can go ahead and get our redirect URI. So we're going to do our redirect and we can get URI. And this is going to be the same redirect URI that you used before, which is going to be your local host. So just keep in mind, you don't actually have to use a local host for this. You can use a website domain that you own if you like. Um, but for now, we're just going to use localhost because it's pretty easy to understand with this. So now that we have all of our data, we can actually go ahead and make a post request to Discord API using Axios. So we can do const outputs equals await axios.post. And we're going to go ahead and get that Discord API that we need to post to. Then we can go ahead and add a comma. We're going to open this up. We can start by getting our form data and then we can get our headers. So we're going to do headers and we can open this up as well. And this is going to be our content type. And this is going to be a very specific type. So this is actually all in the developer portal if you'd like to get access to it. But once you go ahead and put it in here, that's actually all we have to do. So next we can go ahead and say if output.data, we can actually go ahead and open this up. So now we're going to go and get that access token that we can go ahead and use to get user data. So, so far, what we've gone ahead and done is we've gotten our authorization code and from that we've gone ahead and made a post to the discord api and exchanged that code for the token and the refresh token that we can use to get user data so next we can actually go in and define that token so we can do const access equals output a data dot access token so now that we have all this information we're just going to go ahead and start off by getting our user info so we can do const user info equals await axios that gets and we're going to go ahead and get the discord user info now one thing that i would like to mention is you can get all of the api request calls from here so let's say you want to get your user info that's going to be the identify right so we have users slash at me right and we have the same thing for the email right so if we actually go ahead and click on this link here it's going to go ahead and give us the user so it's going to be user slash at me it's going to go ahead and return everything and if you have email as a scope it's going to return the email as well so you can actually go ahead and get all the information you need to make these posts or gets or basically api calls using the discord developer portal documentation and you can get here by searching oop2 in the search bar just so you know now one other thing that i'd like to explain is let's say you were trying to join uh, 
a member to a guild, right? That's one of the guilds join scope. Uh, it's very commonly used for a scam, but let's say we were just using it um, for a bot hosting company or something like that when you authorize on their website. Uh, you're gonna need to read all of this and you're gonna need to go ahead and make your post or for this instance, it's actually a put to this API. Just make sure you follow along with everything it says. For example, all of these parameters down here are optional except for the access token. So you do need access token and all the other information will be in here. That's important to note if you are trying to make other things other than just requesting user data. Um, there's plenty of other things you can do. It's just you need to have a understanding of all this information and how it actually works. So now that we've actually gone ahead and got this link here uh, for the Discord API, we can go ahead and make that call. So we can actually go ahead and open this up. We're gonna get our headers because on the API, it only requires our token. So we can go ahead and get our authorization and we can just go ahead and get our bearer. And this is going to be our access variable. And I'm gonna explain what all this means in just a second, um, but just keep that in mind, go ahead and write it in and we'll go ahead and take a look at it in a second. So now we can actually go ahead and console.log our data. So in here, we're gonna start by doing console.log and we can do output.data. And then after that, we can also do our user info.data. So we're going to go and console.log everything that we've gotten uh, from the API so far. The last thing that we actually have to go in and do to make this run is at the very bottom of the file, we have to do app.listen. And we're going to go ahead and get our port variable. And we can go and open up a function here. And in here, we're just going to go ahead and console.log. And we can go ahead and say a running on and we can go ahead and get our port. So after doing that, we can go over to our terminal up here and we can just go ahead and run node space dot. So as you can see, it's gonna say running on our port. We go over to the authentication link and we go ahead and click authorize here. Now for some reason, it's not loading into the redirect URI, but if we actually go back over to our code here, as you can see, it's gonna give me all my information. Now I do have to blur some of this out because it has my email, which is one of the scopes, um, but just keep that in mind. So it's gonna give me all of my user information. So it's my ID my username, my avatar, my discriminator, basically everything. Um, and my global name as well. And it's gonna go ahead and give me the output as well. See, the first thing that we went ahead and console.logged was our output, and it actually went ahead and gave me my output first, and then next it went ahead and gave me my user data. But in the output, we have our token type, which is bearer, which is why we put that in here, because we actually have to specify the authorization type. And then we actually have our access token, which is the token we put in here. So that's gonna be the token we give to call anything from the API that we need from that user. And this is the token that expires. So if we were to wait like half an hour and then try this again with the exact same token, it's not actually gonna go ahead and work, which is why the refresh token is very, very important. So we actually take this refresh token to get a new token, uh, and I'll show you that in just a second. But that's basically how you can make a call uh, using the Discord API. All right, so now that we've successfully called our API using our token, and we've gone ahead and got our user information. Now what we're gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to get a new token from that refresh token so that you can use this in your own project. So the first thing that we're actually gonna go ahead and do is we're just gonna go ahead and call this refresh token so that we know what we're doing here. Next, we can go ahead and actually copy our form data and our output because it's gonna be the exact same. We're gonna go ahead and paste it down here. Now we're gonna go ahead and call this form data one and we can actually go ahead and call this refresh. So we're gonna change the name of the variable just a bit and we're gonna get our form data one in there as well. So the first thing that we actually have to go ahead and change is instead of our authorization code, we're gonna go ahead and get our refresh token. So that is our grant type. And then we're not gonna need a redirect URI for this. So we can remove that. And we're not gonna need a code. Instead of the code, we're gonna get our refresh token, which is going to be our output dot data dot refresh token. Then in here, it's gonna be the exact same. Our refresh is going to be the same. We're gonna go ahead and call the token API and the content type is going to be the same as well. So now if we go ahead and console.log, our outputs.data, our user info.data, and then finally our refresh.data. We're gonna get all of the data, including the refresh token, which I will demonstrate in just a second. All right, so if we go ahead and click on authorize here again, for some reason, it's not redirecting me. Uh, I think that just could be a Wi-Fi issue. Um, because it works on mobile, so it might be something with my desktop, but it is gonna give me all of the information I need. All right, so over in the console here, we can actually go ahead and start off. So as you can see, the first bit of data that we logged was our output. So that's the first time we called uh, the code, the authorization code, and we got our new access token. 
So this is the first original output. And then from there, we took that access token and we made a call and we got all of this information, which is my information uh, from my access token. So then after that, we went ahead and used our refresh token to get a new access token. As you can see, this is the first access token we had. And this is the second access token we had. They are completely different brand new access token and then it's actually going to give me a new refresh token as well see this refresh token is completely different from this refresh token so because i took my refresh token and i put it into this post here it went ahead and returned pretty much the exact same object here but it had a brand new access token that i can now go ahead and use in my code so let's say for now I wanted to take this access token and I wanted to pull the user info again, I could do so. Now, like I said before, the reason why this access token and the refresh token are essential is the access token expires, but the refresh token does not. So if you're in a project and you saved all this data and you wanted to make a call later, like weeks later, using that info, you would actually have to use this method right here using the refresh token to get a new access token to actually go ahead and make that call. So because it expires, we use the refresh token to make calls to get new tokens that we can then use to get user info. Now, like I said before, if you want to do other things other than just get user information, you can go over to the OAuth2 section and you can go ahead and search for the scopes that you selected on your application. So let's say I wanted to do connections this time and see all of the users connections, even if they're private, by the way. We can actually go ahead and click on connections. And then as you can see here, it's gonna go ahead and use this to get the user's connections. And it requires the OAuth2 scope. Now, pretty much all of these are gonna require the access token. So you can just use this link to make a get, as you can see right here, to get the connections using the access token. So the last thing I wanna go ahead and explain here is you are gonna need a database if you're planning on using this long-term. Like I was mentioning, you're gonna need the refresh token uh, to refresh the access token later on, later in your project. Now you're still using that project, right? You need a way to store uh, the access token and the refresh token, which is going to be a database. So you could use MongoDB or you could use some other form of database to save that user information along with their ID and then call it back later. Uh, I'm just letting you know that that's pretty much the only way that you're gonna be able to store user data as you cannot access it anyway at all later without a database of your own. All right, so that was pretty complicated, but it was pretty effective in explaining how Discord OAuth 2 works. If you do need any help with this, go ahead and join the server in the description below and use our help channels here, and we'll be happy to help you out. And you might as well just join anyways because this is a pretty good coding community if you're interested in that kind of thing. And with that, I'll see you guys in the next video.